My name is Bob Resnick. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm in Santa Monica, California. I've been a Gestalt therapist and Gestalt therapy trainer for over 45 years. When I began, my first unofficial clinical practicum was driving a taxi cab in New York City when I was going to Columbia University working on a master's degree at night. I came out to the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute in 1965, and at that time it was a medical model, and psychologists and psychology interns had to wear white jackets, but in the hierarchy we had short jackets. If you were a full professor, you had a long jacket. Nothing there was very exciting to me. The same platitudes that I had heard for years and years were going on and on and on. And then I stumbled upon Jim Simkin, Fritz Perls, and Gestalt therapy. And it was wonderful. I found a home. I found a place where not only did they say I was allowed to be me, but I was encouraged to be me, to show up, to be there fully in meeting the patient or the client. They were very different people. Fritz was brilliant. He was bold. He was erratic. He looked like he was shooting from the hip sometimes, but he wasn't. He was shooting from a ground of 50 years of doing psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Jim, on the other hand, was quite different. Jim was meticulous, methodical, thorough, a wonderful, wonderful craftsman. He was precise and he was to the point. I was lucky enough to get involved with both of these people who at the beginning started as mentors and over a five year period they became teachers and friends. So for five years I had the opportunity of working with Jim in LA in his Beverly Hills office and working with Fritz at Esalen and following him around the country and working with him in different workshops. It was an incredible kind of an experience that I regard as one of the best things that has ever happened to me professionally. During that time, the most wonderful thing happened for me. Fritz, in 1969, asked me if I would go to Europe and to present Gestalt therapy to Europe for the first time. This was both an exciting and an anxiety-producing situation. All the roots of Gestalt therapy were clearly European in nature, and here I was, a young, brash American psychologist, going to Rotterdam to teach Gestalt therapy. It was a terrific experience. More than that, it was very unique. I may be the luckiest psychotherapist in the world. I was given an opportunity to do this, which allowed me entree to teaching and learning for the next four and a half decades. So every year, I have the opportunity of going to Europe several times and teaching and learning and training with psychotherapists from all different countries, from all different cultures, and from all different therapeutic modalities. This gave me and gives me today a catbird seat where I can see what's going on in psychotherapy around the world as well as be involved in the maturation and involvement of Gestalt therapy both here in the States and abroad. Regrettably, I haven't published very much and in that regard I've been under the radar for these last four and a half decades. But now in my life it seems to be the time where I'm really becoming interested in showing my work in these demonstration films and hopefully beginning to write. I have much of the material already. The process of putting it together is very exciting and daunting to me. The history of Gestalt therapy is quite strange. On the one level, Gestalt therapy hasn't changed in its basics. We are still on a foundation of existentialism. We still rely on field theory, phenomenology, and dialogue. Those are the, the tripod, if you will, of the support system for Gestalt therapy. However, times have changed. There's new information and there's new research. So to stay alive and vital, any system must be open to integrating new information and discriminating which of that new information fits and which of that new information does not fit the world view of that particular model of psychotherapy. So Gestalt therapy is always changing. It is always evolving within the parameters of its basic uh, foundation. Occasionally, things will emerge, research, 
theories, concepts that are so compelling that although they don't fit the worldview, it's imperative to look at the worldview and perhaps change that. An interesting side note on that is that in the United States, at least, in the early 70s and late 60s, there were people who would come to a lecture or maybe even a weekend, and from then on they would call themselves a Gestalt therapist. And they confused what we were doing with some of the encounter groups, and what they would do would take Gestalt therapy as license to do whatever you feel. So it was licensed for psychopathy in some ways, where I can do whatever I please. I don't have to pay much attention to the other. I don't have to pay much attention to my environment. I'm just being authentic. I'm being myself. I'm doing Gestalt therapy. There was a lot of damage done in those days by these distortions of what was called Gestalt therapy. Fortunately, Europe has much less of that, and the rest of the world, South America, has much less of that because that didn't happen in those places as much as it did in the States. So in the States, unfortunately, some of the old-timers will still say, oh, yeah, Gestalt therapy, that's where you would do a lot of catharsis, yelling and screaming, and be mean to people. Uh, hopefully these films will give a new picture of what Gestalt therapy is both at the contemporary and at its base since its inception. Gestalt therapy is first built on the platform of field theory. Field theory, simply put, means that everything is related, that everything is in constant movement, everything is in flux, and everything has an impact and an effect on everything else, whether you can see it at the moment or not. We don't embrace a single causation or a dual causation, but things are created by the entire field. And the person is a part of that field. They're not in that field. They're one of the field elements. And the interaction between the person and their environment, the entire field and the history of the field, is what creates their experience of the moment. The second foundational pillar of Gestalt therapy is phenomenology. Phenomenology has to do with human beings are born as meaning-making organisms. We don't just see and hear and touch and taste things. We make meaning out of them, which is why children are often quite funny, because they make meaning out of things when they don't have really enough data to get the meaning. As a small example, uh, there was a write-up in a local magazine uh, this Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, traditionally, people eat turkey and they stuff their turkey with a mixture of bread and herbs and sometimes sausage and fruit and different things like that. And this little three-year-old girl had her first turkey dinner that she remembered. She may have been there at two, but she wouldn't remember that. And the next day, her parents said to her, how did you like the turkey yesterday? And she said, well, I didn't like the turkey very much, but I liked what he ate last night for dinner. The meaning that the child made was based on what she knows as a three-year-old, her view of the world at the time. It's funny to us, but to her it made perfect sense that what was the stuffing inside the bird was what the bird must have had for dinner the night before. The last and third pillar of what supports Gestalt therapy is the notion of dialogue. In dialogue, the phenomenology of each person meets the phenomenology of the other. And it's at that engagement of phenomenology, which we call dialogue, following in the tradition of Martin Buber, the dialogue is the engagement of the two phenomenologies where difference becomes apparent and where awareness can follow from the difference. Dialogue is also where we have access to the freshest fish. Much of therapy, the client is talking about their phenomenological narrative of what happens outside in the world, in other situations, and with other people. Of course, that's important. That constitutes most of the person's life. And that's what they bring, their narrative, their phenomenology, their meaning-making of what happened outside. When you get a fresh fish, is when there's something that's going on between the client and the therapist. The advantage of this is now you have two phenomenologies. You have, of course, the phenomenology of the client, 
which is important to respect, but equally important is the phenomenology of the therapist, which is also important to respect. And the engagement of those two phenomenologies is where awareness can happen is where learning can happen, is where therapy can happen. In other situations, you don't have two accesses to the same transaction. So much of the relationship, it's not just the relationship is important as the research shows, but what happens in that relationship, what specifically is potent in the relationship is the engagement of the two phenomenologies when there is a transaction between client and therapist. Gestalt therapy is not terribly interested in content. We're not doing problem solving. We are interested in the content, and the client, of course, is interested in the content, which is as it should be, that's their life. But we're interested in a dual sense. We're interested in the content for its own sake, but more importantly, we're interested in content as a vehicle to get to process. Process meaning, what are the patterns, what are the sequences that this person uses to perceive and make meaning in their world, and what are the patterns and the sequences that they use to react to the world, regardless of what the content is. Process is like software. It's like a word processing program. The, the content can be about anything. You can be writing about lofty things, funny things, silly things, sad things, but the process of how the program deals with words, letters, punctuation, format is the same. Similarly, we're looking for what is the process, what is the style that people deal with perceiving and making meaning and with responding to the world. I want to talk a little bit about the goal of Gestalt therapy. Typically, people come into therapy because they want change. And of course, that's their right, and that's important. The therapy, though, from a Gestalt perspective, we are not particularly in the business of change. We are in the business of choice. And so the goal of Gestalt therapy at the fundamental level is the restoration of choice the restoration that the person has full access to what they take in from the world, and they have full access to their resources, and they are aware of both and therefore choiceful in responding to the world. If, when they know another response, they have difficulty with that response, with implementing that response, then the work would shift to what's that difficulty? What gets in the way of doing something different when what you are doing doesn't work very well for you. In Gestalt therapy, our goal is choice. Choice through awareness. The business of therapy is choice and the restoration of that full choice. The client's business is about whether they change or not. The changing is up to the client. Helping them to provide a choice is up to the therapy. Let me say a few words about how we facilitate awareness. How awareness comes about is through difference. Everybody knows that if you put your hand in a bucket of water that's 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, within 30 seconds, you won't know where your fingers end and where the water begins. The reason you don't know that is there's no boundary. There's no difference between the temperature in the water and the temperature of your fingers. As soon as you change the temperature of the water enough, what psychologists call just noticeable difference, by either heating it or cooling it, you begin to create a boundary at the point of where the finger or the skin uh, interfaces with the water. At that point, it's the difference that creates and allows the awareness. So in psychotherapy, one of the most potent places is in the dialogic relationship, where there will always be at least two phenomenologies, the clients and the therapist, and the engaging and touching of those phenomenologies is where difference emerges and awareness comes out of difference. But you need that movement or change to create difference, and you need the difference to create awareness and you need the awareness to create choice.
So it goes in that sequence. Movement creates difference. Difference creates awareness. Awareness creates choice. In everyday parlance, people typically talk about insight and they want to know, is it the same as awareness? And no, it's not quite the same. One way of looking at the difference is insight is something that's usually more cognitive and it's something that I think I know about myself. Yeah, I know this about myself that I do such and such or I feel such and such when. Awareness is much more experience near. Again, it's a much fresher fish. Awareness has to do with being in contact that I'm doing something when I'm actually doing it. If you look at psychotherapy and in general, and gestalt therapy in particular, then difference becomes the factor that goes throughout the therapy. That the difference can happen in the dialogue, the difference can happen with an experiment, the difference can happen with breathing, the difference can happen with voice. It's the difference that creates new information in, the, in terms of awareness that allows for more choice. Now, an experiment is not just to do an experiment. The whole purpose of an experiment is to add new experiential data. And the way to do that is to do something you've never done before and to see what happens. If you know the answer before you do it, it's not an experiment, then it's an exercise. I know that if I run around the block six times, I will be tired. That's an exercise. It's an experiment to see how I feel about it after running around the block six times. Do I like it and feel exhilarated, or do I hate it and are delighted that it's over? So the experiment gives new data into the system. So for example, if we're doing an experiment in the actual session, it might be with modulating the distance between us and paying attention to what comes up in your body, in your breathing, what happens to any anxiety you may have at this distance versus that distance, to begin to track how differences occur at different uh, distances between us. That would be an experiment that we would do in the office for you to learn more about you, how to respect and modulate your own comfort thresholds. An example of an experiment outside would be one that I've done once or twice with men who are afraid of commitment with women. And what I ask them to do is if they drive a stick shift is to not use reverse for the entire week. And find out what happens when you drive your car but you don't have the reverse because most of these men think that every step forward is absolutely irreversible. That commitment means I have no more choice. It's like death. So when you drive your car without a reverse gear, you begin to discover things. I don't go down any alley that I don't see a way out. When I go to park, if the parking is only face in, I don't dare do that. If I go to a movie theater, for example, I have to sit on the aisle. Uh, I need an out. So the costs of driving without reverse make it very clear that my yeses are limited when I don't have a no. When I can't go back, it restricts how forward I can go. That's a very basic lesson to learn, and the experiment gives me some of that data that I wouldn't have had just thinking about it, talking about it, and conceptualizing. Let me switch now and talk a little bit about the Gestalt view of human development. Uh, one of Fritz Perl's analysts was Wilhelm Reich. And Reich, as well as Ronk, both believed that human beings are born self-regulating, that all living things are born, including human beings, self-regulating, which means that the person is in an ecological balance with their environment where they are considering self and environment at some level and they, for both of them to be able to survive. Again, the biological imperative of any biology is survival comes first, because without that, everything else is just a footnote. What happens in growing up is children make the very best organization they can, the healthiest, the most creative organization they can to deal with the environment that is not of their choice. The babies are all Lilliputians in the world of giants. 
and their task is how do I survive in the environment that I find myself in. So kids do that beautifully. The, anything they do in the service of survival in the environment they're in is healthy. We must be pretty good at that or most of us wouldn't be able to be here even talking about it. This is the ecology between me as part of the field with the rest of the field in the co-creation of life and survival. What's interesting is that in most psychotherapy today, it is generally accepted that to understand a human being, you have to also understand them within their environment. This was not always true. In the 1930s, when Pearls first put this out, it was close to heresy to classic psychoanalysis, which was the popular psychotherapy of the time with some behaviorism as well. The classic psychoanalytic view was the, the punctuation of where the analysis went was to the individual psyche, to the unresolved, unconscious conflicts of that particular person. The only major voice besides Fritz was Harry Stack Sullivan, the father of social psychiatry. And the Sullivanian view is that people live in a context. And Fritz expanded that to really looking at it as an ecosystem, what he called the organismic environmental field. Today, that's been assimilated by almost all modern psychotherapies, uh, but it wasn't so in the 30s. It was a cutting-edge concept at the time. In Gestalt therapy, we call the balance between the self-regulation of the person and the field an ecosystem because, in fact, that's what it is. The back and forth between the person and their environment, being able to take in from the environment that what you need, being able to discriminate what you don't need and you need to get rid of, what's nourishing to take in and assimilate, what's toxic to keep out. That balance works for both the individual and for the environment. One of the biggest changes in Gestalt therapy from classic psychoanalysis is the following. Up till the time that Fritz began to write, psychoanalysis was looking at the past in an attempt to understand the present. The analysts of the day, they weren't particularly interested in the past for the past sake. It was a means whereby for them to attempt to understand the present by first understanding the past. As psychoanalysis progressed, that so-called id psychology shifted to ego psychology where they were looking more at the present to Fritz, who says that at the, in the present, you can understand if you need to, but more importantly, you can access the relevant past. It's the present that you need to look at in order to understand the present. And anything from the past that is relevant to interrupting present functioning will show itself in the present. And that's where it's palpable. That's where you don't have to speculate about it. You don't have to build theories about it. It's palpable. It's accessible. It's experimentable. It's verifiable. That's the advantage of working in the present. Working in the present doesn't mean you're denying the importance of the past, but you're looking at what part of the past is nourishing the present and what part of the past is interrupting good present functioning. How this all comes together is the child is born self-regulating in an environment that they must survive in. They do whatever it takes, if they're lucky enough, in the service of survival and they survive. So if a kid is born into a crazy family, or a war-torn family, or a bombastic family, or a drunken family, that child has the same task. I have to learn how to survive in this environment. And many children, most children, fortunately, do that. So if it's a very toxic environment, what they learn is the best thing for me is to shut up, keep my mouth closed, and withdraw and scan very carefully before I dare to come out. Because one time I'll come out and I'll be patted on the head, and 20 minutes later I'll come out and I'll be slammed against the wall. That kid, if he's smart, learns to stay in, keep their own counsel, and scan. That's healthy. What happens, though, is that style of being in the world, 
that way of relating to the environment becomes fixed. It becomes habitual, which means it goes below the level of awareness, which is what habit is. That's the birth of character. Character is composed of actual learning experience. It's composed of interjects, which are rules and values that your parents, your culture, or your church cram down your throat before you have any ability to discriminate. And of course, there are some interjects that small children do need in order to survive, like don't cross the street, no. But for the most part, the interjects, we don't know yet if they're good for me or not, because they haven't been tasted, experimented with, or discriminated, they swallowed whole. So character comes from those interjects, it comes from my real learning experiences, it comes from my attachment history, it comes with my contact boundary history, it comes from vicariously what I see and the meaning I make of it, and I make that into part of my character, and all of that becomes solidified and frozen. So now the child is 25 years old, and they can uh, walk and they can talk, all things they couldn't do before. They now have a credit card, they may even have a cell phone, and they are still following the same characterological way in the world. They keep their mouth shut, they stay back, and they scan. That's character. Character is anachronistic. In Greek, ana means wrong, chronos means time. It's the wrong time. It was healthy back there. It is toxic, or at least not helpful here. That it's acontextual, it's obsolete, and it's anachronistic. It's like a horse and buggy on a super highway. It works in one situation. It doesn't work very well in the other. So bottom line, character is the freeze framing of what was a healthy and creative way of surviving in the world that becomes rigidified, goes below awareness, and habitually repeats itself acontextually. What's important is character has two parts. Character is, half of it is how I perceive the world and how I make meaning. Those fixed ways of perceiving and making meaning, which is very similar what some therapies today are calling schema theory. The other half is how I characteristically, repetitively, habitually respond and behave in response to, to the world. The question arises, are all psychological difficulties seen as a function of character? There's pretty good research that indicates that severe psychosis like schizophrenia and um, severe mood disorders like bipolar disorders have a very heavy genetic and or biochemical basis. So those we can't really say are characterologically based, although they will affect the formation of character because they, form, they affect who the person is in the first place. But from a Gestalt point of view, we see all of the non-genetic ones as being related to character interrupting self-regulation. Since character is a habit, of course there are examples where character can be very helpful and very supportive. For instance, tying your shoe. You don't want to have to think about that each time. You can tie your shoe as a habit very quickly and very well. So habits that serve you well, they serve you well because they're efficient. You don't have to be aware of doing it each time. And they, they further your need satisfaction and the satisfaction of the environment. From this point of view of human development, and character being an interruption of self-regulation, then therapy can be seen as an interruption of that interruption. By interruption, I don't mean say stop it, but to slow it down so the person can be aware of, become aware of what they are doing and how they are doing it that interrupts them from self-regulating. What, they, what comes up in their, in their head, what fantasies they have, what happens in their body, whatever the cues are in the breathing and the anxiety. To be able to track the interruption is to interrupt the interruption. To talk about character as an interruption of self-regulation sounds very similar to what 
ecologists call pollutants. One of the best definitions from an ecological perspective of pollutant is that a pollutant is a resource out of place. There is nothing inherently wrong with it other than it's out of place. It's not contextual. So there are chemicals, for example, that when they're used for some things are very useful in creating medicines or doing processes that we really need and we really like. But if you take that same chemical and put it in your milk, it might kill you. It's not that there's anything wrong with the chemical. It's that it's a very good resource over here, but it is very toxic over here. So if you look at character that way, character becomes a pollutant of self-regulation. It was very healthy. We all came by our stuff honestly. It was healthy when we formed because it allowed us to survive. We're doing it automatically now, and at this point, the character is a pollutant. What we don't know is how exportable is Gestalt therapy to other cultures, being that it's a process-oriented therapy, that we're not trying to make people look any particular way, but rather we're trying to restore choicefulness for that person to self-regulate in their environment. If that really holds up, then it will be quite exportable to almost any culture. Interestingly, my wife Rita and I have been recently invited to present, along with a few German Gestalt trainers, at the first Gestalt conference in Nanjing, China, at the University of Nanjing. And I've been asked to do the open keynote plenary address, and this is exactly the topic that I will be talking about, the exportability of a process therapy to a culture like China, which is so different than the European or Euro-American culture that it has come from. And we don't know yet how far we, it will be found useful by the Chinese or other cultures. We're hoping. Before we go to the films, I want to just set a little bit of the context here. For the last 40 years, I've been involved with the Summer Residential Gestalt Training Program in Europe, first through the auspices of the Gestalt Therapy Institute of Los Angeles, and since 1997 through Gestalt Associates Training LA. We have a program that is probably the longest running psychotherapy training program in the world. This is a program that has 80 to 90 participants from 25 different countries, and there are five levels of training from basic to master class. These films occur within this training. Each group has maybe 12 to 14 participants. They are all therapists, but the program is both didactic and experiential. So people work on their own personal issues within the group as well as in individual therapy during the day. These are sessions with real people in real time working with real issues. These are not actors. There is no script. They are therapists, but they are working on their own issues. Nothing in the editing has added anything or taken out anything. The only editing that has happened is switching back and forth between the two cameras. It is in real time. It is real therapy. I invite you to look at these films with as open a mind as possible with a sense of humor, and with the possibility to perceptually reorganize. I hope you enjoy them, and I hope you find them useful. Thank you.